Hey there, and welcome to Art for All. Uh, I'm Danny Gregory. I'm an artist and a writer and the founder of Sketchbook School, and I'm joined today by my friend John Muir Laws. Hi there. <laughs> um, I am John Muir Laws. I am a scientist with a sketchbook, um, a uh, rabid curiosity for the world, and uh, my little sketchbook buddy is my best way of unpacking that. Rabid, you say. You should look. At, you should have that looked at. <laughs> if you start foaming at the mouth during this recording, I'm leaving. It's uh, but yeah, it's it's catching. I got to warn you about that. <laughs> the inf ever infectious John. Ever <laughs> infectious. That's right. All right. Good. And well, now we have the podcast vector for to spread this even further. So that's, yes, exactly. that's working for me. Exactly. In fact, if you're listening to this, we want you to go out and infect at least two other people and get them to come and listen or watch Art for All, the creative podcast about curiosity and sketchbooks and whatever. But today's topic, let's not fool around. Today's topic is, we hope, fear, creative fear. We'll see. So that's that's what we've said as our topic. We hope to adhere to it. As you know, if you've ever watched or listened to this before, you know we're kind of like a, like a drunken sailor staggering down the uh, <laughs> staggering down the the boardwalk. We could plunge off into the ocean at any time. We could fall into the bushes on the other side. You but never if know. we do, it's going to be interesting and fun. Exactly. So. We'll see where we go. So fear, um, I feel like we live in fearful times in general anyway, don't you think? These last few years uh, have been times of fear. more so than ever. Yeah, fearful. And then we get used to it. We get used to fear, but then we get new forms of fear. But, but we don't want this to be a downer. We want to have an, up, an, up, an upbeat, friendly, hilarious conversation about terror, anxiety, and fear. I think that's a, I think that's a good <laughs> I think that's a good objective, don't you? <laughs> Let's. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know, but I'm I'm not afraid to find out. So, um, you know, I get a lot of kind of people writing to me and saying that they're afraid of things to do with making art. They're afraid. I mean, I have people who say I bought a brand new sketchbook and I'm afraid to use mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I think how much did you spend on this sketchbook? You know, it's 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 kind of amazing how drawing and f um, creativity can bring out this fear. Why is that? Why do you think that is that we're so well, afraid of it? In, in in defense of that person who's who's feeling afraid, I feel it too. You do? Um, yeah. Um, I um, I get performance anxiety um, in 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 front sometimes in front of of art supplies or or any skill especially when i feel like i'm supposed to perform um that you know now like do the art thing um which has been challenging for me um because i've started doing these these live workshops uh, where i somebody says like you know i'm having a hard time drawing a horse i'm thinking like horse oh boy ah you know, and uh, and like okay, so draw, so let's let's go there. As you know, in in the past, what I could do is I could um, I could prepare a class with sort of step by step instructions and do the drawing five times before I um, am doing it uh, uh, with with my students, and um, also if the on some of those if the drawing didn't work out, I would just do another one and I could use slides to show like first do this and then do this. And that's, that's really different than somebody calling you up and saying, okay, and now horse. And you're thinking like, how exactly does the face of a horse look? Right? Why the long, um, why the long face? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> long face. So uh, for, for me, I think the, the a lot of the fear is, we, in, in our culture, we identify ourselves a lot with the things that we're competent at. So you ask somebody what their, 
what they're about, what they're interested in. People often talk to you about what they're good at. And if my identity is wrapped around those competencies, if I'm in a beginner place with anything, that's a real vulnerability. And I think that not just in our head, I think that there's there are, there are people that look at people who are starting something and they say, well, well, that's not that's not where I think it it should be, both in other people's stuff and and their own. We judge it and cast a judgment on the person. I think that we're we're afraid of that because I think a lot of people do judge us that way. And so in turn, we then turn around and start judging ourselves that way. So let's say I'm trying to, to start a new skill. I, if I am, as I'm starting to, let's say, let's say learning how to draw and I make a few marks on the page and that does not look like a horse. I am that that shuts me down. I, I start thinking like, well, that's that's the that's the most horse I will ever do. Yeah, that's sad. I'm gonna. I want to unpack what you've just been saying because I disagree with some of it. Oh, good. This is this is where things get fun. <laughs> I disagree with it. Um, so, I think you're talking about a couple different things. On one hand you or I as like people who are supposed to know what we're doing, we have fear, anxiety, we have anxiety because if in fact we don't know what we're doing, then what the hell are we doing? Right? So if you, if you come out, it's kind of like if you're a magician and you come out on the stage and you know, you say pick a card and then it turns out not to be that card, then the whole reason for being there is kind of pointless. So we're supposed to be, or at least we think we are, we're supposed to be pretty good at doing this stuff. So therefore you have a bit of anxiety around that. That's a little bit of what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about somebody who has never done this before, there's by the same uh, measurement, there's, there shouldn't be any reason that they should be good at it. Right. They've never done it before. I mean, if I suddenly had to go and juggle chainsaws or something like that, I wouldn't be good at it. And I don't think anybody would expect me to be. And so therefore I wouldn't be nervous in that way. I wouldn't be afraid in that. I mean, I might be afraid of juggling chainsaws, but I'm not afraid of, of the failing, failing aspect of it necessarily. Although we as adults are generally often afraid of failing. Like we're afraid of looking foolish, even if it's something we've never done before. We're still, we're still embarrassed easily. And in fact, I think I've told you about this when I went to clown school. So clown school is in part about being foolish in public and being being um, a proxy for people in a way. It's kind of like there's, there's a universality to clowns where we look at them and in some, on some level they are scapegoats, right? They're like, oh, we can all laugh at him, but really we're laughing at ourselves or we're, mm-hmm. we're relating. It's the clown our, mirror. Right, we're relating to that and we're saying, and they're playing out our fears, right? That's why, that's why comedy, stand-up comedians, that's why they're funny because they say stuff that you kind of have vaguely thought or you haven't really, didn't really realize anybody else had thought about it. A lot of that's what it is. It's the, sm- the laugh of recognition, right? So, so, so we have that, that thing where we say, um, as adults, we're just, we don't want to look foolish. We don't want to compromise our own authority. Um, you know, if, I mean, I, I'm sure you've had this as a dad, right? As a dad, you... You sort of have to appear like an, like you know what you're doing to your kids. You have to you know you have to appear like you um, are correct or you have the answers. And so, but yet, a lot of times as as parents, we're also willing to be foolish, right? Hopefully, you are. Unless you're like a real autocratic sort of horror show. But <laughs> well, I, I actually, on, I. I I, I don't want to interrupt you, but it because um, you're also going to talk about sort of the, these sort of key points where we dis, we're disagreeing. But part of the, uh, but I do want to return to the idea of not being perfect in front of your kids. So I'll just put a stick a bookmark okay. in there, put a and then, in there. Um, or 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 a little post it. So okay, a little post it. So I think where we where at least I disagree with what you said, and I don't know if you necessarily feel this, but. You said that we are afraid of people judging us and that a lot of people are judging us. And my feeling is that actually nobody's really judging you about almost ah. anything you do. 
I think most people just don't care. They're not paying attention to you. They're not thinking about you. They're not particularly interested in you. They, if you're really good at something, they might be interested in it, but they might also be jealous of it. There's all kinds of reactions that we can have to it. But I think by and large, particularly when it comes to something like drawing, you sit down to draw something, you say, hey, I've never drawn before. You start drawing. Honestly, nobody cares. Nobody cares if you, you know, John's, well, I was going to say John, but <laughs> that's a bad choice. You, Bob <laughs> Smith, who's never drawn before, does a drawing. I don't think and it's not good, who cares? Like, there's, I have nothing invested in you doing that. I have nothing to gain if you succeed at it. I have nothing to lose if you fail at it. It's irrelevant to me. So, but yet we tend to think that because we, we have this part of our brain that uses that as a, as a stick to beat us with when we do something new and different. And I think that to me is really where the issue is, is it isn't really about other people's opinions. That's byproduct or a side effect. The real issue is we're afraid of doing new things. And that is a very primal thing that, um, you know, I, I've written quite a lot about this, about this, the inner critic and its role in controlling us and why we have this. Like, why do we, why are we afraid of looking foolish? Why are we afraid of the bad things that can happen? And that is a survival mechanism that has been in us for gazillions of years, which is if you try something new, there's a possibility that something bad will happen if you do, like something really bad. Like you'll go mm -hmm. to a place where something terrible could happen to you. You'll eat a plant that could kill you. You will, you know, go up to some stranger and they'll turn out to be, you know, violent and try to attack you. So instead, we have stranger danger, we have don't eat new foods, we have don't travel to unfamiliar places, we have all these things that are really, really primal, and it goes back to when you were a kid, you know, get down from there, don't run with scissors, you'll put your eye out, all those things that we were told to protect ourselves from new experiences. And they're told to us that it's such a formative time, and they're also built into uh, the part of our brain the amygdala that's gonna um that's there to get us to react and to 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 run away or to start to fight somebody um and and releases the neurochemicals that you know cause us to sweat or our heart rate to increase all those things that we do to survive that's really primal and that's there to protect us but unfortunately, it becomes it's 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 so essential and so central, and then we have all these things that we've experienced since then that layer over it. But it's still down there, like this 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 big hairy thumb on the kill switch that's waiting to stop us. And so that's you know, and I think that there are certainly things that are legitimate, like don't go to certain places. That is legitimate. Don't do certain things. But when it comes to sitting down and doing a drawing with a pencil on a piece of paper that nobody else is going to see why do we have that you know why do we have that and i think it's related i don't think it's entirely that but i think that that is why it's so primal and almost irrational mm. Mm. because it is something new and different and uh you know and and also because there are expectations associated with it that we should be good at it because there mm -hmm. are people who are good at it and when you see the people who are good at it you sort of think well they are good at it because they were born good at it. And I wasn't born good at it, so therefore I'm not good at it. What, that, what you're not seeing, of course, is that that person worked at this skill for many, many years, and they were brave enough to push past that fear of the new stuff and to try and do this thing that they were unfamiliar with to the point that they got decent at it, but they were probably lousy at it initially too. So I don't think it's a violent disagreement with you, but I think well, I just and, articulate and, it differently. So, and and and... Listening to the way that you unpacked that, I I agree with you. So let me. Um, so the, the way I often think is, I, things will come out of my mouth, and then I, rather than having a dog in the fight with those things, those are are on the table in plastic, and 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 so I reserve the right to 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 change my mind in the presence of of compelling arguments, which is. 
um, <laughs> I think is a good skill uh, or, or a good objective to have. So I, I like your idea that, that the other person is probably much less judgmental than we think they are. But however, we are the judge. We're kind of afraid of being judged by others, but really that is our own, um, the, the big judgmental force will come from someplace inside of us where we are comparing ourselves to um, people who have been practicing this skill for longer. Um, it's, like, it's like a sort of like, what will people say? And the fact is, mm-hmm. we know that in most, most situations where people say, what will people say, people won't actually say anything. Right. You know, people don't really, it's not, it's not like we're living in like a, like a Jane Austen novel or something like that, where everybody's sitting around waiting to gossip and rip us apart and throw us out of society because we did something. People just don't care. People actually Uh do things that you wouldn't do in a Jane Austen novel these days and get away with it. So, yeah. So, but, but that, 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 that self critic that I think sometimes we, we, we blame it on, as I was, on other people. But really, it is something that is coming from, from inside us. I think that that is, I think, a fear of not being competent or not appearing competent. Um, and that's, it's being in that sort of in the beginner space is a, is a vulnerability. And I think it's and, also a space that we go back to as you said, you've been drawing for, for hundreds of years, and yet you can still go back to that space. Right. So sometimes I am, I, I, I find myself, um, if, if oh, here, here's, here's uh, actually, here, here's a, a, a kind of parallel place where I find this comes up for me. Sometimes in my journal, the drawings um, come out as pretty pictures, right? I've been doing this for a long time. So sometimes I get pretty pictures. Sometimes I get three pretty pictures in a row, sometimes five, right? Because I've been doing it for a while. But what I find is that if there's a number of pages in this journal where that are just really aesthetically pleasing to me, I don't know if you've ever had this this happen to you, but for me, sometimes I'll start feeling kind of nervous. Like now I'm starting to think that my journal is supposed to be pretty pictures because I had several in a row that were, and I will have hesitancy. I will have fear of then getting out my journal and thinking, oh, I, well, I'll say to myself, I'll come up with these excuses like, well, there isn't really time to do this, to do this right, or something like that. And I'll find these excuses not to crack open my journal because I then am afraid that something will pop down on the page and it won't be big air quotes around, you know, good. Um, and very often the, the best anecdote for that uh, or not anecdote, antidote. <laughs> um, the best antidote for that seems to be just making myself do something, do something, and or to to give yourself a page or two of just gestures, and or to start writing on the page, do something kind of to shake me out of this. If the idea that. I need to, because I had several drawings and they, 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 they worked, I then can get paralyzed by that. And so I need to, I need to get myself to, to reframe again, why I am nature journaling, why I've got my sketchbook out and go back to, I often find I have to remind myself the same thing that I remind my students to do. Like we're doing this to remember, we're doing this to observe, we're doing this to connect with the world. And that's why we're doing this. But sometimes the fetish of the journal, I will start to feel like I need to feed that. And that that makes me fearful and it shuts me down. I hear you. Yeah, I understand that. I think it's, you know, in a way it's kind of like you can be like a, a baseball player who has to wear the same socks every day, you know, because he's on a hitting streak and you don't want to <laughs> mess with that. But I think it's also, as you say, pretty pictures – um, or, or doing like the perfect drawing is one thing that you can do. 
means you're in a in a groove, you're in a particular zone. Um, but I think you can also be like a successful rock star or something like that, who's always afraid that that the streak is going to end and they're going to go back to being not famous anymore, or they're going to be a failure mm-hmm. in some way. And that that can almost be a self fulfilling thing where you're so afraid of doing a bad drawing that you can't do a drawing at all. And then, or you're thinking this is going to be, this one's going to be bad. And that often is the case. I've often, I've had this exercise where I do with people where I'll say, do a bad drawing. Let's do a bad drawing. And it will be bad if it's not bad. So do a bad yes. drawing, right? And if you don't, and you better <laughs> not fail down, doing like a bad it. drawing. If it turns out to be a good drawing, you know, you'll have failed. So let's do a bad drawing. And like, let's think about what makes it a bad drawing. Why is it bad? Is it bad because of how you feel? Is it bad because of distortion? Is it bad because you um, missed out details or you weren't observant enough? Like, what is it? What is it that makes it a bad drawing? Can you, if you, and if you think about what makes it a bad drawing, sometimes you can make sure you don't go to that place. Um, You know, but also I think a lot of times you end up when you do an exercise like that, I'm setting out to do a bad drawing, you're giving yourself permission to relax a bit because at worst, it's a bad drawing, which is actually what your goal was. So therefore, I mean, I, I can't tell you how often when I do that, people say it turned out good and I get yeah. really angry at yeah. them for failing. Well, yeah. Uh, no, those th- go to the back of the class. Exactly. The, um, and what what I like about that is that the solution there you're 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 feeling paralyzed because you might do a bad drawing. Then the goal is to make a drawing, and the secret is there that it just gets you making a drawing. And that's 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 the place that we have to get back to. So that that very often for me is kind of unstops my bottle if I just kind of give myself to put you know permission to put stuff down on the page, and. Um, and 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 reconnect myself with why I actually am doing this. Do you think a lot of people don't know why they're doing it? Like, in other words, hey, I'd like to learn to draw. Well, why would you like to learn to draw? Well, it would be cool. Or I would do a drawing that I could hang on the wall. Or I've always wanted to do an illustrated children's book. Or, you know, it would be cool to, like, maybe sell my stuff that I do on Etsy. And, you know, so... Whatever it is, like, I find that a lot of times people don't really know why they want to draw. Besides, it's kind of a thing I always thought, sort of thought I should know how to do. I think you have to get to a point where you kind of know why this is a good thing to do. And, and a lot of times that can come from just having done one drawing that was really fun to do. And you did a drawing, and you're like, oh, I'm really in the groove. This is really fun to do. I want to have this fun feeling again. And then you say, what made it a fun feeling? Was it the fact that it turned out really well? Or was it just, I was just playing or I was just, you know, learning or discovering. And that's what was fun about it. I think it does warrant a little bit of thought um, as to what the purpose of this whole thing is. And, and uh, that, I, I think that that's, that's key to, to kind of getting this turning this into a habit that you regularly have to be really clear with yourself about why are you doing this? Um, and you mentioned one critical thing is that the process itself can be, can be really fun. It can be incredibly pleasurable to sit there with your pen and brush, just kind of flicking away at something. Um, but sometimes I also am doing it and I don't have that same, I don't know if fun is the right expression for it, but for me, it's an, a very powerful way of getting lost in something. Sort of, if I want to sort of get myself into a flow state, put me in front of a phenomenon and give me a pen and a pad of paper and I'm, I'm going to disappear into that. The so for me, a, a a big goal is to um, is to pay attention. A big goal is to remember more vividly. 
and sometimes sometimes it's a sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's a pretty picture but even if it wasn't it didn't kind of get to 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 fun that kind of connection that with the world that you get when you when you just fall into uh, a, a a a moment or a place oh, that that for me is why that's a big part of why why I'm there. What about for you? What what what's your why behind doing this? Well, I think I started to do it because I wanted to get out of my head. You know, and I I was in a really dark place and I found that drawing pulled me out of it. Drawing put me in the present. And a lot of the darkness that I got was from thinking about the future and the past and not being present. So I would worry about what was going to happen, what's going to be the outcome, and trying to conjure up various terrible situations that were genuinely scary. And so drawing allowed me to be right here now and realize that that's all that actually exists and um, that, that being present engaging with something in front of me or something that I'm imagining and getting deeper and deeper into it was a really pleasurable experience because for its almost therapeutic value. And so the aesthetics mm -hmm. of it, I, f I did find that I did better drawings, quote unquote, better drawings when I was more fully engaged. Mm -hmm. I was being mm -hmm. more authentic about it. And I was also being going deeper um, and when I go went deeper, I saw more, I slowed down. I was just, I wasn't distracted. I think a lot of times if you're fearful, you never get to this flow state because you're thinking all the time about, well, I'm, is this a flow state? Am I there yet already? I'm just, I can't seem to let go. I, uh, you know, it's like that. It's like when you learn to meditate or something, you know, meditation is so hard because your brain won't shut off and you can't. You know, and, and every time you get distracted from your mantra, whatever it is that you're meditating about, as soon as you get distracted, you feel like, oh, I failed that. I'm not doing it. Oh, no, I can't do this. this isn't the thing. I'm, I'm just not one of those people. And blah, 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 blah. And you have to be able to let go and say, okay, we've gone down that little path now. Now let's get back on where we were and go back to doing it. But if at its core you're afraid, it's like I had this amazing conversation with this person who this is this is any i don't know i think this is a an ex, perhaps slightly extreme example but she um had done a drawing that she wanted to put on a t-shirt okay i was like okay why don't you do it she said well i've done the drawing i said well you know how to get it put on a t-shirt right there's like companies you can go online you can just send them the design they'll print it on the t-shirt they'll send it to you doesn't cost a lot of money. She's like, yeah, I understand all that. But if, you know, like what if it turns out well? Or what if I wear it and other people want one? Then, you know, I'd have to like invest a whole bunch in making a whole bunch of them. And then, you know, I like, I might want to think that that's like could be a company and I'd have to set up a company and I'd have to, you know, I don't know if I have the time for my job. I'm like, what if what people might, where I work found out about this, that I was doing this on the side, like that could jeopardize. And she just went down this whole thing. And I was like, seriously, like we're talking about making one t-shirt with one design on it. And I said to her, you know, this is kind of nuts. You got to just go and get, make this t-shirt. <laughs> and she did. But, but uh, to me, it was really illuminating because I thought that's tied into what we think of art, right? Art is... And this goes back to when you were a kid or when you were a teenager and you were like, oh, I like to draw. Oh, you should go to art school. Uh, well, if I went to art school, then I wouldn't go to a regular school. And then I'd have to try and make a job as an artist and then I would starve and then I would die. So you, <laughs> here's this thing you love doing, but there's so much fear associated with what could possibly come out of it that you can't even take step because you see this path that leads to this thing when there's of course a million other paths that could lead to a million other places that you have no idea about but again going back to this 
primal thing, better to stay on the straight and narrow, better to do what everybody around you tells you, tells you should do. Um, they're smarter. They, they know what they're doing. Don't be a maverick. Don't go off in the bushes. Uh, stay the path. So I think that that's, it's so complicated. This very simple thing that we all did when we were six, pick up a crayon, draw a bird, can suddenly become like a thing that could destroy your life. And uh, that's, that's something we can't fight against. I mean, it's not, it's not something that you can't fix because you can, you know? I think a lot of times the way to fix it is just by doing a drawing. Allow yourself to do a drawing and see if you get to a good place. And then after that, you can do another one. Right. But if you sit down and do that drawing and you don't get to a good place, then what? Well, it was just one drawing. I think the same thing applies. Just sit down and do another drawing. Right. You know? and, and so, but, but we, um, we condition ourselves with each drawing that we do. So if my goal is I want to make a pretty picture, and I do a drawing and I look down and I say to myself objectively, this is not a pretty picture, All right? Then I'm not getting positive feedback from that. And it is making it more difficult for me then to pick up the pencil the next time and do it again. And so that's why I think that your, your idea of reframing why we do art or, and being really intentional about what is motivating me and what is driving me on that is so valuable, is so important. Because if I, you know, for instance, if my goal is I want to learn, um, I, I want to pay attention to what, I, I want to pay attention to this bird more deeply and I make a drawing of it, and it's not a pretty picture of that bird, I still will have intensely studied that bird in the process of making that. And then that drawing did its job. Or if the job of it is, I want to remember this street scene more vividly. And so I sit down at the cafe and I look out and I, I make a, a sketch of a place. That place is then burned into my experience in memory and whether or not it's a, a pretty picture or not, whether it worked as, um, you know, composition and value and, or all of these art things, that is secondary to the fact that I now, this little moment sitting by the side of the road there is this rich part of my life. And while I was there, I was... I was paying so much attention to the, 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 the heartbeat of the world around me. That's, that's a real gift. Or another kind of outcome that if I'm kind of can be clear about myself is, um, is I want to learn how to think with imagery. I want to learn how to think with pictures and become a visual thinker. All of those have the, um, if, if, I, if my goal is more of this sort of thinking about the process that I'm doing rather than the product that I'm making, that then gives me permission to make another product, to make another product, to make another one, because I'm still engaging positively with this process. But the minute I get kind of wrapped around the axle about the product itself, then all the voices and the judgments start kind of bubbling up around me saying, who do you think you are? Right. But, oh, 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 now you're an artist. Oh, come now. And those, that little kind of inner gremlin can really, really shut, I know, shut me down. So, but keeping my, my eye on those processes, like, wow, this, I, I was, this, this last weekend, I was at, adventuring with my family and we were going into this area of caves looking for bats and i made a little diagram of um i had made some landscape drawings that day that were sort of artistically um 
you know, not the way that I had envisioned it in my head when my pencil, my pen first kind of approached the page. But this little diagram of this cave system in cross section showing the structure of the cave and where the bats were. When I got done with that, I thought like, like that's, that's a really useful way of conveying that information, right? That was a really, and so I got this little kind of squirt of dopamine by, it wasn't necessarily a pretty picture, but it was an interesting way of communicating and conveying that in, information. And that really motivated me then to make the next drawing and the next drawing and the next drawing. So why was that drawing, that cross section, why was it a better drawing than your landscapes? Um, it communicated the information when you were, when you were making it, I mean, like, why did you do a better job of it? Um, probably part of it is that I had made those other drawings already that day and that, that had kind of gotten my warm, my brain warmed up and into a place where more stuff could follow that was perhaps you know, connecting me more with um, the, the 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 thinking or the process. It may be that those, uh, you know, how, how if you're if you're making pancakes, the first pancakes off the griddle never really come out. They're always kind of messed up, and you so you have to make some sacrificial pancakes in order to get the the, the, the rest the of them. Of <laughs> sacrificial pancakes. So in my journal, I think of like each day, the the first several drawings of the day are, those are probably going to be the sacrificial pancakes, but you need to go through those in order to kind of reconnect your, your, your brain. Um, that's why at, at the start of a lot of figure drawing classes, they have people doing like all this fast gesture sketching. It's like, get those sacrificial pancakes out of the way. Let's just reconnect up here. And uh, then as you kind of go along, the, um, your ability to, uh, perhaps your vision, my ability to visualize and, and to, to think on the paper, um, the way to that was cleared by those first landscape drawings that were not quite what my brain was saying they were supposed to be, that the, the, the judging part the sort of thinking, you know, capital A art was saying like, like, oh no, that's not quite right. That's not quite right. But they didn't stop me. They still, there was enough space for that, the next one to come through the diagram of this cave structure. And um, so I, I, I guess there is, there's also in that perhaps maybe thinking about the process of kind of getting to that place that you need to kind of give yourself permission to make your sacrificial pancakes. Because if you never make those, then you're not yeah, going to be that's doing anything gonna, with a syrup. That's where I was going to go with it. I think you were talking about a particular day where you did some things that, that kind of got you into the right frame of mind to do one good one. But I think you can look at your whole drawing endeavor, larger scale, and you can say, if you're starting out, you should be making those sacrificial pancakes. You should be doing drawings that are, you know, again, like practicing parking with your dad in the parking lot when you were 15. It's like you're doing these things under these circumstances in order to get to the good one. And the good one may not happen today. You know, it may not be that, you know, that you do three, three drawings that are horrible and then suddenly you get to do the fourth one that's great. It might. But it might take a month to get to that point. And it might be hard to persevere because you don't think that you will get there because you don't, you don't believe me and you don't believe us in this thing that you have to do the bad things. But, but the fact is you will if you stick to it. There's no, there's no question that you will get to a point of facility to some extent um, way beyond where you are now. It's kind of like when you go to a baseball game and they're in the batter circle I mean, they're warming up on the side, right? They they swing and they put the big weight on the on the on their bat, and they and then they step up to the plate, right? They go, you go through that every every thing, you know. You do warm up exercises, and no matter what it is, you know, you you go in the orchestra's tuning up. It's it's a standard part of it, 
is to do just sort of screwing around with things and then you get down to business. But, um, you know, I think if, again, if your objective is to have fun, I think you can also look at yourself and say, you know what, I'm torturing myself so that I can have fun. It doesn't make sense. If, if you're doing a lousy drawing, you can still have fun doing a lousy drawing. You can have fun at it. It doesn't really yeah, matter if it's bad, es right? Especially if you are you kind of help yourself think about your um, – that, that, that's why I think reframing your goals is so, so kind of critical there. Because if your goal is, I want to make a pretty picture, and it's not coming out a pretty picture, that's a lot less fun. But if your goal is, I'm going to geek out on this bird and I want to, let's see how much I can notice about this bird. Um, or I want to, let's see what I can do to take this, this moment by the curb and embed this moment into my brain so deeply. Um, I, if you move the goalpost to, again, those, 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 those process things you can do those things and it's fun right what about um fear of burning out do you ever mm. have that when or or fear of like writer's block you know writer's block is is another form of fear um or i mean you could be drawing you could be writing you could be creative you could have done it for years. You could be so good at it that you're a professional and then suddenly you can't do it anymore or you're afraid that one day you won't be able to do it. Anymore. Then what? Have you ever had any of those kinds of experiences? I, I, I guess, I guess for me that I, I have had times where, and I think they may have been related to depression where I am not inspired and motivated to pick up my journal and I really get out of the habit and it sits there and collects dust. And I think that those are probably, those are tied for me to when I am in a, um, in, in, in a depression. Interestingly enough, one of the things that's most powerful for getting me out of that is getting out in nature, getting some exercise, and falling into a flow state, observing some wonder of the world in front of me. And it brings me out of myself and into that connection with the world. But the, when I'm in that state, though, the last thing I want to do is go pick up my nature journal and go out and play outside with it. But it is the best thing that I could do to, 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 to solve that. But I'm not motivated to go pick it up. Sometimes my, when I've been in these states, my wife has looked at me and she said, you know, uh, honey bear, <laughs> I think you need to go nature journaling. Go out and play. And I, I, yeah, yeah. I think just, and, I, and to that I would say like, um, yeah, okay, but maybe, you know, after I do this, you know, I knew maybe I should answer these emails first. And she's like, no, <laughs> really, really look, look at me. <laughs> I think you need to go nature journaling. And then I like, oh, maybe I need to go nature journaling. And I do. And, and then that depression loses, loosens its grip. One of the things is that, you know, it's also kind of helping, helps you realize that, oh, I'm in a depression. When you are in a depression, you think that that's what's going on. Uh, or you think that you actually just have this kind of, you've got some kind of clear perce perception on on the bleakness of things. But then you kind of get out there and you go like, oh, no, that was a, that's, a, that's a depression and there's a choice. Right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've experienced the same thing. It's kind of like, it's a weird thing where you know that this thing could fix you but you can't do it because it hasn't fixed you. It's like a sort of vicious cycle that you're in where um, the cure is right there, but you can't, you can't, you know, the energy to pick up the bottle and, and drink it, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this, to me, what's helpful sometimes is also being relatively rigid with myself about um, 
systems and processes of saying like, I do this every day, you know, you can apply, like you can apply that to an exercise program. Mm -hmm. you know, every day I get up and I go and I do this thing every day. And then you say, eh, I don't feel like it, but you have this thing where you say, do it anyway, do it anyway. Even if it's not good, do it anyway. And I think the same can apply to drawing. I think, you know, I mean, one thing I tell people is, you know, it's okay to skip a day now and then, but don't skip two days and try and do it more than you don't do it. You know, have that as your rule, you know, but I think it's also oh, helpful to say- I like the way you frame that. Yeah, it's also helpful to say, you do it every day. And if you miss a day, you just do it the next day. But your goal is, and I think, you know, there are things that they, so many of these like exercise apps and things like that, that have what they call gamification, where they reward you for streaks, right? Have you done it X number of days in a, in a week or how, in a row or how many weeks in a row have you done it? Um, this idea that, that we're just going to keep, it doesn't matter whether you had a good workout or not. What matters is you tried and you showed up and you, and you did something. And, um, you know, that's like, it's like this, uh, artist who I work with, she does a painting a day, every day she does a painting in her journal and she suffers from migraines and occasionally she just can't bring herself to do it. But her rule is even if she just makes a dot on the page with a pen, she has to do something, even if it's just that dot. And sometimes making that dot, she can say, okay, I can actually do go beyond that. Um, you know, another, another um, thing that I do sometimes is I'll draw a small square on a page, an inch square. And I'll say, I'm going to spend two minutes today, two minutes doing a drawing inside that. And what I might draw is I might just look around me at something and to say, I'm going to draw like that little corner of the room. I'm going to draw that part of the desk. I'm going to fill in this square with a drawing of that thing. And then the next day, I'm going to do another square. And what you find is if you do that, two things happen. One, even if every drawing is terrible, there's something about a page full of little squares drawings that is really cool. I, it's just like a, I, I equate it to like when you have uh, a chorus, a choir or something like that of amateur people, they sound better together. You know, they sound good together. It's like better than any individual singing. Uh, Hallelujah. I mean, you might sound bad to, by yourself, but in a group, you sound pretty good. And so that that suddenly all those bad drawings together add up to something good. Another thing that you also find when you do those little squares is there'll be a day where you said, that one was fun. I'm going to do another one. And you're allowed to do two in a day. You know, you're allowed to keep going mm -hmm. if you want to. And I think that that kind of a thing where you say, at the bare minimum, I must do one square inch of a drawing but if i feel like doing more it's okay so i think you have to be kind of like what, what your the role that your wife was playing you have to kind of do that for yourself where you say do it anyway just do mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. you have to go and do it and you know and the success is that you did it success isn't that it was good Yes, yes. that you did it. So there, there you're moving that goalpost. So it's not right. about that square. It was about the process of creating that square, the uh, what you had to do with your 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 brain to get you to that point. And that can help you with depression because so yes. often with depression, it's yeah. like just get out of bed, just <laughs> put on some pants, just you know, step outside. Just doing that one thing can often break the cycle, you know, and yeah. again, right? You're then picking up the reins again. Right. You're, you're returning to normalcy because depression can just be this, this environment that you're in, you know, where everything's reflecting mm -hmm. back on it and mm -hmm. nothing seems to make sense. And there just doesn't seem to be any way. But as soon as you break inertia, you start moving, it becomes easier and you start to build on it. And the thing about making art is, it's incredibly therapeutic, even bad art, it's incredibly therapeutic. So starting to do it will light the fire. It's like you've got that one little spark going, this fire will start and then you will start to feel better. The voices in your head will calm down, you know? But, you, but if you sit there thinking, before I do this, it's gonna suck, you will never 
you, you, you know, it's so much harder to get past that. Whereas if you say it's okay if I if it sucks because it's just one square, then maybe you'll mm-hmm. do it. The um, and then you can also sort of wrap into that the 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 effect that being in nature has on our brains and our hearts, our minds and our bodies respond to being out in nature. There's all sorts of, you know, there's, there's crazy studies like looking at, like if you've got a, a hospital room and your hospital bed looks out on, on the wall of the, another wing of the hospital. Um, and just down the hall, there's another person who's got a bed in their window and looks out at this tree. There was actually was this hospital where this study was was done. Some people were looking out at the wall. Some people were looking out at the tree. And the people who were looking at the tree. They had better outcomes. There was less hospitalization time. They needed less pain medication. They needed, you know, there's all these. Um, they're better outcomes. They're they're they were less of a a, a nuisance to the nursing staff. Um, just being in contact with nature um, for even just a, a, a little bit of time um, does our brain incredible benefits. Um, and yeah. so if you get your, if you can kind of get yourself out in nature for, with your journal, then your journal is also this tool that invites you into deeper reflection. You talked earlier about how the journal essentially forces you to be here and now the goal of all these different meditation practices is like you know how can i get myself to be present in this moment and you have to do that when you are making the sketch of what you see down the lane and those things together incredibly powerful medicine yeah and i think nature can take so many different forms right nature could just be your your cat sitting on the windowsill. Nature could be, you know, huge elaborate forest with lots of different life forms in it. But there's something about it. I mean, I remember this experience that I had when I was going through a very difficult time and things felt really, really bleak. And I was, I walked up Fifth Avenue and I got to Bryant Park behind the New York Public Library on 42nd Street. And it was just a beautiful day, which when you're feeling really bad can in some ways be even worse. Like the, the cruel indifference of nature, like how can you make it such a beautiful day when it's so terrible? Like 9-11 was a beautiful day in New York. Yes. It was clear blue skies and, and everything. So, and I remember I sat down on the grass in this park and everybody around me was, you know, people are eating lunch and people are having animated conversations with each other. And I sat there and I just felt more and more alone. And then I looked at this tree. There was a tree that I was sitting underneath it. I was just looking at this tree and there's somehow this little glimmer of a thought appeared in my mind, which was this tree's been here for quite a while. Like that was the thought, like this tree has been here, like sitting here all the time in this park. There's something about that thought, this thought that this thing had endured and grown Mm -hmm and gone through cycles and all that stuff, that thought like was suddenly really comforting to me. And I realized like this too will pass. It's a pretty trite thought, but no. there's something about it that I was like, okay, you know what? Like this tree has seen it come and go. This tree has been here for a hundred years, a big oak tree. Um, like it's, it's, it's going to change. It's going to be okay. Uh, just trust the process. I, I almost couldn't articulate it, but but I felt like this tree was had seen me somehow and it transmitted this idea to me. I don't know what it was, but it was really, um, and I've had that experience since. I had that in the, during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, sitting and watching the birds in our backyard and realizing like, th- these birds don't care. Like these birds are fine. They're living their life here, sitting on the phone lines. They don't have a home to go to. They don't have stores of food. They don't have protective clothing, but they're fine. They're fine. They've been here forever. And, uh, you know, there's something about that thought that, that can raise you up out of a depression when you realize, like, it's, a, it's okay. They're okay. That's, that's so powerful. And then knowing that, you give yourself, when you're in that state, 
can you go put yourself in the ideal situation for for helping reverse those those feelings or to get a different perspective you're you you got outside you went for a walk you got exercise you went into nature um and I guess we're also now saying bring your, your sketchbook along. Well, because your sketchbook and, helps you to connect to that. If you sat and yeah, drew, drew that tree, absolutely, you would connect to that tree. It doesn't matter if you did a good tree drawing. What could be more irrelevant, right? It's kind of like if you, you know, if you believe in prayer and you got down and you knelt and you prayed, would you really care if you got the words of the prayer exactly right? Would you really care if you weren't entirely coherent? No. It's the same kind of a process where you go, okay. You know, and if I went for a walk, but then I, at one point, like kind of stumbled a little bit because I tripped over a curb, would I say, well, forget it. A walk is a wash. It's no point to it. No, no, it's the doing. It's the being. It's, it's the process that matters and the, and the, and the willingness to do it, doing, to do this thing. I remember having surgery and the doctors told me before, and they said, as soon as you get out of surgery, within a couple of hours, we're going to want you to start walking. And I was like, What? I was going to spend like a month in bed. No, no, no. Within a day, you have to walk a mile a day. Within a week, you have to walk four miles a day. I was like, are you out of your mind? But no, that's what your body needs. It needs to move. It needs for all your systems to flow, not to be sort of hunkered down and, you know, closed in on yourself. And drawing is somehow that process of engagement and flow. All right. I think we've dealt with fear. I think we've solved the problem. The world is a better place now. Oh, the, 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 what, what, um, what are your top strategies for getting past the fear of either the new journal or the blank page? Let's say, so I find like once, once I'm, I've, I'm, I'm journaling in a day, more stuff is going to follow that. But how do you, how do you kind of, get yourself to go into a new journal and kind of come over the, 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 the fear of that tabla rasa. Um, and on a, on a particular day, how can you kind of get yourself into that state where you and your friend are running around and you're sketching every crashed airplane that you find? I think there've been a lot of times where I've had a new sketchbook and I'm like, ah, oh, it's pristine. Yeah. Start the first page, write my name and a phone number or email address on the first page. I've marked it now. And then I do the, and then I used to do like an, a title page and I'd write a little quote. And I would write the day. So you can do something like that where you've like, okay, I've, I'm like a dog who's like peed on it. You know, I've made my mark <laughs> and it's now, it's now mine. But then I would also, I, I can still see like if I go through a lot of my sketchbooks, like the first two or three pages are really kind of tight, kind of, you know, trying to be really good, trying to be really perfect. And then suddenly you'd get to a page and you screwed something up and you're like, ah, forget it from now on. It's like, this is not going to be a perfect sketchbook. I'm just going to just do whatever I have to do. So I found that like, it can help to just say, go 10 pages in and do it there. Yeah. Do 10 pages and then do a couple pages and then, then go back to the beginning. Now you've kind of broken the back of it. You've warmed up. The first page doesn't matter anymore. And again, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a sketchbook. It costs you 10 bucks, you know, buy a whole bunch of them. Just, it's not, it really isn't important. It really isn't a, a perfect thing. It's a tool to help you tool. to yes. connect to yourself. Right. So it's kind of like, you wouldn't say, oh, you know, I, I, uh, I bought a, a box of nails and a hammer and I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to, you know, bend the first nail. So I'm not going to, it's just, there's a million things like that where you just, you just got to try it out. It doesn't matter. And, and if you think about it a month, a year, 10 years from now, when you look back on it, if there's a page where you did a drawing, that's not very interesting. You turn the page and you look at the next one. It's not like mm -hmm. that. It's going to ruin. Mm -hmm. It's not like a bad note. That's going to ruin the entire uh, concert. It's just a, it's just a drawing. It's just a page and, uh, you know, it really, perfectionism is one of the, your inner critics, most powerful tools. Perfectionism ah. is, uh, is, has a thousand different ways to stymie you because perfectionism isn't about 
doing it perfectly. It's about never doing it perfectly enough. And, and it, and it oh, is, oh, wait, wait, say that again. Say that again. Perfectionism isn't about doing it perfectly. It's about never doing it perfectly enough. You never, Mic drop. <laughs> you never <laughs> yeah, you, you, you are always, and it can apply not to just your drawing, it can apply to everything because it becomes almost like an OCD sort of thing where you can say, I can't, you know, I, I, I need to do this. I need to park my car more perfectly. You know, I need to get a line perfectly between the lines. Um, you know, I need to dress perfectly. I mean, you can just, you can get really obsessive about it, but it's just designed again, going back to that voice in your head that doesn't want you to try anything new. It's a way of keeping you in the house. You know, you're not ready to go and do this thing yet because you don't have it right. You're not ready to, you know, share what you've made with the world where you might get in trouble for having done it. So it always tells you it's not good enough. And the same is, and procrastination is a is a, a henchman of perfectionism because procrastination says, yeah, you know, let's keep, maybe you, maybe you haven't bought the right pen yet. Or, you know, if you, you can, certainly you can start drawing, but wait, why don't you wait for that uh, workshop that John Muir Laws is going to lead that's going to be in three months? Why don't you, you know, and we can sign up for that in a couple of months. It, there's always a reason to put it off. And another form of aspect of perfection is, is never being able to finish something. It's not quite good enough yet. Keep, keep doing it, keep polishing it, keep adding another line, keep doing another thing. And again, it's just, it just never gets you off the hook. And that is, again, nothing to do with why you're doing this. You're not doing it to make perfect things. So perfectionism is irrelevant, really. It's just recognize it for what it is. It is a way to sabotage yourself, to stop yourself from doing things. It's not, it's not that you're making something great. That's not what right. it's about. It's that you're not making something. And if you keep trying to be perfect, then you never make anything. Yes. And if, you never, if you make something that's less than perfect, and you put it out there and then you get response to it or somebody sees it and it inspires them to do something else. It's part of the flow. It's part of getting it out there. It's part of this giant network that we're all a part of, a network that's kind of wraps around the world. And you can add to it or you can hold back. But if you hold back, you don't get to be part of it. Whereas if you let it go and you put it out there, even if it's not perfect, it still is going to have a lot of value. Um, I think it's, again, going back to science, the idea that, you know, as a scientist, you might publish a finding that may not be a universal theory that covers everything, but it contributes to the knowledge that right. then maybe somebody else responds to and makes it a bit better. But if you withhold it because it doesn't solve every problem perfectly, then you're not contributing. You're not part of it. I mean, I think about, um, what's his name? Uh, Russell, who wrote... Uh, sort of a, an earlier version of the origin of species, right? Um, what was his name? Alfred Russell? Oh, Wallace. Well, Wallace. Was it Wallace? Yes. It was one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you uh, know what talking about, right? Alfred so Russell he Wallace. put off yep. publishing his theory of evolution. And meanwhile, Darwin, who was a bit more ambitious, got his out there. Well, oh, actually, That's I why think we can't it, remember this guy's <laughs> name. But we, of course, remember Charles Darwin's name. Um, or, or, or to... Um... I think the, the way that it went is that Ch that uh, that Chuck was actually sitting on it. That he was sitting he on was, it. Really? Yeah, he he was scared to get it out, and then um, he uh, got a letter from Wall Wallace saying, you know, you know, you know, I, you know. I uh, would love to, to, to see what you, you, you think about this idea. Um, and he looks down at this letter and there is this, this thing that he has been working on for years in the, the writing of this young uh, or younger um, uh, scientist, biologist oh, and, biologist, yeah. and, Oh my goodness! So what he did is they they published it together. Really, I had always okay. I have it wrong. I like my version of the story better because it it proves my point. 
but but you're right on the name. So the, the, uh, Alf, the truth, Alfred the truth Russell Wallace. Away. So Russell Wall, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace is the is the 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 the, the fellow. But um, he was, I, I I believe that you know he had he came up with this uh, this idea independently, but and that actually helped sort of prompt Charles Darwin to to get off to, his stuff. Kind of like I think we we'd better publish this. But sure. but instead of sort of saying like this is my idea did this i think a, a, a very um handled it very gracefully by um by by having that be um uh, something that they published together right so you've ru- you've you've ruined my point but i'm going to make a better oh. one I, okay <laughs> I, I mean i think going back to evolution evolution is another example of uh iterative response right so it isn't that there's like a perfect life form. It's that evolution is iterative response that we, that you know, cre- creatures have to a response to a thing, to a phenomenon, right? They respond to it by coming up with some new version, new response to it. And then, and a lot of times it doesn't work perfectly. They need to keep adjusting it. They need to develop new variations on it. And those variations solve the problem better and better. Similarly, if, if, if you held back on it, if you hold back on your solution, you may not actually ever perfect it. It's kind of in the field that it needs to be perfected. That's certainly mm-hmm. like when it comes to developing, for instance, technology <clears throat> software, a lot of times technology companies will put out a version of their technology knowing that they're going to have to continue to fix it and change it, but they can't really tell whether it works until it's out there. You know, and so I think the same thing is like it's a perfectly normal part of creativity to yeah. put out half baked ideas or flawed ideas or f- ideas in f- you know, that are somewhat formed and allow the world and other artists and your audience to help you to make adjustments and make it better. That's just part of the creative process. So that's that's different than the idea of the, create the masterpiece. And that your career leads to creating this masterpiece. Um, that's you know the, the if that what, what a that's what a, a myth. That's a myth. It's yeah, it's, a myth. it's it's you're going to do the next the next reasonable thing with the tools that you've got with where you are with what's inspiring you, right. and you're going to put that together. And and your your comparison to the process of science, I think, is really apt. So science is this process of kind of coming up with the best understanding for uh, of the, the best explanation for the information that we have on hand. And that's going to be modified over time and then modified over time. So some people get really wrapped around the axle about by saying like, you know, scientists used to believe this and now they believe this. So we can't trust science. Right. Um, that's totally missing the point of what this process is of the, they're not, we're not saying, so the, 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 you know, science is not in the business of, this is going to sound strange coming from a scientist. So scientist is not in the business of truth, right? So we're not saying this is, this is the truth. We're saying that this is our best understanding given the information that we have at the time. Yeah, it's the best available answer, right? And yeah, and if I change my, you know, uh, and and I because I don't, I'm not an omnipotent uh, entity. Um, I I don't know if this is, you know, it 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 may be truth or maybe it's not. But if if it's useful, right? If I can make predictions from it and those predictions sort of pan out, that is useful. And that's interesting. And given our best understanding of something, um, at this point, I you know we can we can get we can launch a rocket and have it go through through space, and then a chunk of it flies off and descends at controlled speeds through the Martian atmosphere, lands without getting broken, and then launches a helicopter. <laughs> right? That's that's using our we're not saying that our understanding of gravitation is truth. We're saying that it is useful, 
right? It is, it's, it's a useful explanation and it will be modified over time. And, uh, but little by little, it changes and gets better and better. And so does our artwork. So does, you know, anything which we are, are, are working at. So instead of kind of the goal of truth, the goal of the masterpiece, the goal, having a goal of um, what can I do to move the ball down the field just a little bit? Yeah, and I think you can that look I may at, never get there is okay. You look, yeah, you can look at your drawing process in the same terms, where you can say, this drawing is my best understanding of the thing I'm looking at right now. Using the tools that I have, the skills that I have, the time that I have, the brain that I have right now. Yes. It isn't to say that I won't learn more or won't get better, but this is the one that I have right now. And just be be that gentle and objective with yourself and say, okay, this is where I got mm -hmm. to today. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. maybe I'll sleep better. Tomorrow, maybe I'll, you know, take a little bit more time. Maybe tomorrow I won't be worrying about some other thing and I'll do a slightly better drawing. Yeah. Let's find out. We'll see. But that's there's it's nothing to do with fear. There's nothing to fear in this equation. It's simply an experiment. It's simply uh, a learning opportunity to see what happens when I do this. And if you are afraid of experiencing that, you're missing out. You're missing out on something really great, something that could really change your life, connect you with the world around you, and just be fun. So I think you'll agree with John that the, the, the advice that we would give people is just do it. Just try this experiment. And keep trying it because, again, it may take thousands of attempts. But if each, if each attempt is fun and you're going into it in the right spirit, it's not going to be a drag. You know, you're going to make some progress. You're going to try some stuff. You're going to learn a few new things. You're going to watch some more videos. You're going to look at a few more books. You're going to look at some other artists' stuff. You're going to make some progress. There's no rush. We don't have to get – there's no destination we have to get to. We just have to enjoy this process. And allow ourselves to do it. And that's why fear doesn't really matter. So talk yourself out of it if you can. Hopefully we did a good job. We certainly talked enough. <laughs> talk the back legs off of whatever the term is. So I think we're going to have to wrap it up because we are, you know, beyond our, um, our self-imposed deadline. But I have to say I am quite pleased with the fact that we managed to stay on topic for an hour, 12 minutes, and 34 seconds. So that's... Congratulations to us for that. Or a few side roads, but we ended up talking about fear again. And we did. So we put yes. that in as, as, as a win for staying on topic. Fear. So hopefully you aren't going to be afraid of joining us again next time we do this, which we yeah. will do next week. I think it was fun to do. <clears throat> do you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Yeah, just this idea of, you know, to, to trust in, trust in this process and, um, it will show its own worth. Um, and the, the, the critical thing that we, we hit it several different ways, but if the goal isn't the pretty picture that comes down on your piece of paper, but the goal is the experience or the process that you're having, that mindset is going to give you permission to make lots and lots of drawings. And if you do that, you will start to see those drawings that are the pretty pictures, but we get to it by, by, by not having that be our target. It ends up being an incidental consequence of this process. But even without that, this process of, of drawing and journaling and um, letting the world wash over us makes our lives richer and um, is, is in itself, um, worth the time and the energy um, that we have. Well said. And now I'm going to go off and do some drawing now that I'm all talked out. So I will see you next week. And I'm going to play our, our exit theme music. What do you think? Are you, ready? Are you ready for that final moment? Let's bring it out. All right, good. Thanks for joining us. See you again next time. Thank mm. you, Danny.